Hi, I'm Patrick Dunnikin. At Gibbons, we believe that citizens need to be informed about the complex issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Northward Center, PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. The Fidelco Group, Verizon, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community, Josh S. Weston, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And by Observer New Jersey Politics. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, this is Steve Adubato. More importantly, I'm here at the, in the atrium of the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. This is an extraordinary place where the most important conversations often take place, and tonight is no exception. Tonight is a conversation that is called Moving New Jersey's Communities Forward, a critical conversation about race and policing. The um, Institute for Social Justice has put it together along with some partnering organizations, and we decided to come here and talk to some folks, folks who are part of the um, audience, 600 people of RSVP, a group of distinguished panelists representing all different perspectives in the minority community and in the law enforcement community. So the question becomes, could Newark be, with all of its challenges in the police and minority community over the years since the rebellion of 1967, could Newark become a model for how the police and the minority community interact moving forward? That is what the discussion is about tonight at NJPAC. Those are the people we'll be talking to. That is the subject, and this is a half hour that is worth checking out. We're talking to one of the organizers of this very important conversation about uh, the police minority relations. She is LaShawn Warren, Vice President and General Counsel, New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. We're here at NJPAC. A critical conversation about race and policing. Why now? Why so critical? Well, there have been a number of important developments in the city of Newark, including the consent decree that was entered into with the city and the United States Department of Justice. And so the, with these developments, we thought that it was a critical time to bring the community together to hear about these developments and give them an opportunity to weigh in. Yeah, we were talking to your, your director, Ryan Haygood, about some of the, there are 10 specific recommendations to improve things that the Institute has put out. Just share a couple um, with us beyond the body cameras for police officers. What are some of the other very concrete recommendations that are being put forth? Because we'll be talking solutions as well as, listen, there'll be some honest, difficult, emotional conversation tonight, but some recommendations. So one of the things that we are urging people to do is to join our New Jersey's Communities Forward initiative. And basically that initiative brings the community and police together and tries to foster better relationships. And in doing that, it creates a safe space for people to have candid con candid, concrete um, conversations and to actually have recommendations for how we can improve community police relations. So I want to be clear, this is, this conversation tonight at NJPAC is critical, but it is one of many. It is one of many. One of the things that the consent decree requires is for the monitor to actually do a number of surveys, to survey perceptions of the community and how they feel about policing in the community, and to make sure that we are including their recommendations in the reform efforts. Let me ask you this. We are in Newark tonight, but there's Camden, there's Jersey City, there is Patterson, there is Trenton. We're talking about cities and other communities where things have happened and could happen. Why is Newark's experience so important across the state and nation? Well, I think Newark has a very important and interesting history, um, beginning with the rebellion of 1967, which actually emanated from... John Smith, the cab driver. Right. It emanated from a police community la um, connection and um, dispute. And I'm sorry, to be clear, I, I should not have just said that in that way. 
there was a sense that John Smith, who was a cab driver at the time, um, the police had taken him in and there was questions as to how he was being treated at the police station and there was a sense that something was happening with him down there that was beyond what should have been happening and his vi rights may have been violated and things happened from there. Did I get that wrong? No, that's right. There was police ab abuse that was um, alleged um, alleged in, in this particular situation and it was not, it was symptomatic of many other issues that happened in the community where police abuse was a problem. And so starting with that particular history, Newark is unique in that we've been struggling with this issue for a very long time. And I think what separates um, Newark from some of the other cities is that we have this consent decree. There was a 2014 investigation from the Department of Justice entered it, and, and based on that investigation, we now have this consent decree. So we really do have an opportunity to reform the police department and be a, a model not only for the state, but for the nation. One more question. In your work, have you seen another city or a city, a community that appears to, I'm not going to even say getting, it appears to be getting it right, that really seems to be on the right track of police minority relations, really doing good things? I think Newark is d making con a concerted effort to do things right. I can't say that it's the only city that's it's working in that particular space. But, but we're I, on the right track. But we are on the right track. We are not there yet. But... I think in time, with this monitoring team and the reforms that we expect to come out of that, that we will have a class, a class one type of, of, of police department that can serve as a model for the state and indeed the nation. Thank you so much for talking to us, but also for bringing everyone together tonight. Thank you. We're here with um, the director of public safety in the city of Newark, Anthony Ambrose, who knows a little bit about uh, policing and dealing with the minority community. Why did you choose to participate as one of the lead panelists tonight? Well, I think we, what's, what's going on in Newark, New Jersey, first of all, coming back to Newark with a consent decree, uh, with some of the patterns and practices uh, that was found, that was uncovered by the federal government, uh, I think it's important that I have a passion for the job, I have a passion for the city, and uh, I'd like to come back and uh, fix some of the issues uh, that are occurring right now in the city. It's so interesting, the director talks about the consent decree, the federal government, the Department of Justice came in and said, look, Things are not what they should be. They examined it for a long period of time and they came to the conclusion that uh, certain stops were taking place that should not be taking place, that some profiling was taking place. And ultimately, you didn't fight it and say, hey, no, we're not going to go along with this. Why are you saying I want to be a part of the solution? And, and by the way, what kind of reaction are you getting from the rank and file? A well, positive reaction. I think that uh, this consent decree it has to be looked at that we can uh, improve our patterns and practices and we, we we could evolve around this and become the best and probably be a model for American policing. Why don't we break this down a little bit? Give us one concrete example of a police, uh, the word reform means different things to different people, one action that the police will be taking that you believe would improve relations between police and the minority community. Well, I think the first thing is the, is the community policing segment. Uh, you know, it's very serious. Uh, it, you know, community policing can have a different definitions to many police officers. Uh, you know, but the bottom line, it's, it's, it's to get trust and to mingle with the community. And that's important. That word trust is like in any relationship. So I think uh, with the training that's going to be put forth uh, uh, by the DOJ uh, in our monitor, I think it's going to be very important that we're going to put the police officers in a different direction. That basically, you know, when we, when we signed up for this, these jobs, uh, we can't have a bad day. The public can and I think that's what they're going to learn. P community policing. Break that down just a little bit for us. It, it, uh, what does it really look like? Community policing, there's several aspects, but there's, there's one major aspect. The one major aspect is working with the community. That's community policing. From a block watch group to a, a street closure, to have a, a group of young kids playing in the middle of the street and the police officers uh, interacting with them, uh, to to any type of engagement, positive engagement with the community. And uh, that's what I think that, you know, uh, Nork has gone a long way since 30 years ago when I became a police officer. I, when I came on, I don't, I don't, I could actually say there was really very a slim engagement. Uh, then we went, we peaked, and then we kind of went down somewhere, and it's peaks and valleys. But I think that uh, with, with the consent decree and with the mandates, I think that the officers, uh, you know, we have to change the mindset and the culture of the officers. And I think that's important because right now we're hiring a lot of new officers. Yeah, let's talk about the hiring of new officers and to what degree the police department has come, become more diverse. 
Well, the, the, the police department is, is, is very diverse. I mean, you're talking about 42% Hispanic, 34% African American, 22% uh, white, and the remaining uh, other. So I think it's very diverse. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I was became a police officer, uh, it was more like almost 50% or maybe almost 60% white. Uh, we didn't mirror the community that we served. And How I, much does that matter in terms of connecting to the community? I think it's important. I think that, uh, you know, a police officer is trained, a police officer uh, has their function that they have to perform. Uh, but I think it's important that, that the police department, uh, when they go out there in the community, that we mirror the people that we're serving. That helps. In the spirit of being candid and putting it out there, to what degree do you find some of your police colleagues feeling concerned about some of the quote-unquote anti-police rhetoric being directed at them? Well, it's not liked. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's, like, it's like the citizens. The, the majority, the vast majority of the Newark citizens are great people, law-abiding. They want the police. The criminals that are involved in criminal enterprises don't want the police in their neighborhoods. Well, it's the same thing that I see. The majority and the vast majority of the police department are hard-working police officers, men and women. Uh, when they see, you know, police officers in Baton Rouge and in Dallas, Texas being assassinated, uh, you know, it gives them a chilling effect on doing their job each and every day. You always have that in your, on your mind that it could happen to you, but it's actually happening to you. Uh, so the majority of the officers, they want to have a good relationship with the community. They want to work with the community. They want to be able to uh, problem solve with the community. And I think that it has to be uh, pushed from the top and it has to be uh, led by the top and it has to be condoned by the top. And that's what I stand for. Final question, this conversation that you have, we are one of several panelists. What would make tonight a success here at NJPAC from your perspective? I think tonight, is, is, there's not only one single thing. I think that tonight we, we come to, to enlighten one another. I like these type of forums. I mean, when you listen to the community, uh, I get my instructions from the community. Uh, with, with usually the complaints, they, 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 they are relevant. And tonight when, when we talk to these uh, other uh, people that are on the panel with me and we talk to the community, you know, it's, it, it's good because it, it opens up the, uh, it opens up the uh, you know, doors for communication. That's important communication. Uh, I learn, they learn, uh, it enlightens us, and I think we move forward. But I think we need more of these. Thank you, Director. Thank you. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. The crowd is gathering here at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. It's going to be a historic night, an important night. The uh, conversation is called Moving New Jersey Communities Forward, a critical conversation about race and policing. Um, and one of the folks very much a part of this is the guy I'm talking to right now. We've had the honor of talking to you many times in public broadcasting. Junius Williams, Chair, New York Celebration 350 and Director of the Abbott Leadership Institute at the great Rutgers University in Newark. Amen. Junius, you have seen, you've experienced this issue, this complex set of issues in a way that few others have. You were there and you understood 1967, the rebellion, in, f in ways others may not have. Tell us where we are today with these issues and what tonight needs to accomplish. Well, unfortunately, we've seemingly only begun the conversation. Uh, there is no closure uh, because it keeps on staying with us. How do we hold the police accountable? And it is a complex issue. It's not just a black or white issue. Uh, it's not just a matter of saying you got to do the right thing. Uh, there's a whole series and set of circumstances that have to be considered before we come up with some answers. So I hope that's what we do tonight. One thing about you that always strikes me is that every time we've spoken, and even though you've been through some challenging situations, you remain optimistic. Talk to us about why you're optimistic in spite of the challenges regarding police-minority relations. Young people, young people. Uh, some of them have taken the lessons that uh, we've given them. Uh, some of them realize that they stand on broad shoulders. I know I have standing on the shoulders of people who have come before me. So as long as we can pass that on and people can continue to make it better. I love Black Lives Matter because they are maturing, they're becoming more uh, valuable to us every day, the more I read about them and hear about them. So I think that's why I'm 
optimistic. Let me play devil's advocate for a second. To what degree do you feel like folks like yourself, who have been leading protests, who have been making change during really, really tough times, how open do you think that the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement would be to advice from folks like yourself, particularly when it comes to, we were just talking to one of the leaders before about some of the anti-police rhetoric, which clearly comes from a very small fraction uh, faction, if you will, of that organization. Do you engage them? Yes. Some of them listen. Some of them you have to make listen. Uh, because the answer is the answer. Now, whether you take your time and do some study and some research and come up with some information, or whether you get in trouble because you didn't prepare, you're going to get the answer. Just like I had to get the answer. We weren't that Accepting, we weren't that. that uh, uh, we we weren't accepting the leadership that had come before us too readily at times. But as you get out there in the street, and as you grow into the suites, you find that uh, there's some things that are just time honored and have to be done. Finally. Tonight would be a success with this conversation here at NJPAC if what happens. This is part of many conversations, but to find success tonight. I think tonight is about conversation. Uh, I, I think that Ryan Haygood is on the money for trying to bring... The Institute for Social Justice. The Institute for Social Justice. I think Newark 350, Newark Celebration 350 is very important because we help make some of this possible. Uh, we're very glad to be a part of this. This is a birthday celebration for Newark, but it's also a time for us to move forward. So we have to take that history, rewrap it, repackage it, come up with some new ideas from young people, and see if we can't find a better way to go. We're here at NJPAC talking to uh, Portia Allen Kyle, attorney for the American Civil Liberties Union of New Jersey, um, here tonight, a very important forum on police minority relations because. Well, number one, there's just a lot to talk about. You know, we're um, at a very critical moment. We're trying to um, build a relationship that's never quite been healthy, <laughs> that's always been fragile, mm -hmm. and, you know, making sure that we're doing things the right way, that we are um, accountable, we are transparent, and, you know, working together and staying this path towards transformation. Let's be clear. Uh, the city of Newark, the police department, is under a consent decree. Mm -hmm. The American Civil Liberties Union, we interviewed your, your executive director, uh, Rudy, many times. The bottom line is this. Um, the federal government, the Department of Justice, determined through a series of, of years looking at this that what was going on between the police department and the community that it was policing, which caused a federal monitor, in this case Peter Harvey, the former attorney general in the great state of New Jersey, to come in and be the federal monitor to oversee what's going on in the police department. Put that in context for us. Well, the DLJ report really found that um, many of the stops being conducted were unconstitutional, upwards of 75%. Um, there were a lot of pretextual stops, a lot of theft by officers not being investigated. Um, and so what the consent decree- Was there profiling? Certainly um, profiling and- By race. Profiling by race um, and, you know, a lot of other- um, a lot of other factors and characteristics that, you know, have also um, led to these transgressions, I'll put it that way, by the police department. But what the consent decree really provides is a opportunity to, at least for the, um, for the police department, to transform, right, to completely acknowledge the past, acknowledge the history, and then move forward, you know, taking into account um, the community perspective, um, making, again, implementing policies that have community input, community feedback, that are transparent, that um, particularly with regards to body cameras, um, the consent- Why is that so important, body cameras? By the way, people are coming into NJPAC. That's why you hear people coming through. The security is having people come through. Um, so the Department of Justice has said there are certain things that need to be changed. Why do body cameras matter so much in all this? Well, body cameras only matter um, if the policies behind them are strong, right? So if body cameras are actually going to be a tool for accountability and have the policies that support data transparency and public access to footage, then body cameras can be a great tool. Um, if they're going to be implemented as just another way of 
police to surveil the community without any opportunity to um, view the footage, but for being prosecuted, <laughs> for one, or the goodwill of the prosecutor, then you know we're not exactly supportive of you know that use of body camera policies, not to mention the questionable funding for body cameras in general. Um, currently, the attorney general has you know, released forfeiture funds to support body camera implementation programs around the state. And um, as well, you may or may not know, the practices of civil forfeiture, which is basically taking assets from- Taking people's stuff. Taking, you know, taking people's stuff during arrests. Um, so if you have arrests you know, and stops without a constitutional basis and you're you know, seizing property in that and then using it to fund the accountability program, the body camera program is only as viable as the amount of money seized. Let me ask you this. With the Department of Justice overseeing the North Police Department, or say any police department because of the transgressions that have been identified. And by the way, the head of public safety in the city of Newark, Anthony Ambrose, a former chief in the police department, he is on board. He's working collaboratively with um, the federal monitor, Peter Harvey. What do you say to some devil's advocate question? Rank and file officers who say, it's hard to be a cop on the street and do your job well with, quote, the feds looking over your shoulder. You say? I disagree. Um, policing doesn't have to involve violating people's constitutional rights. And in fact, perhaps if the federal government had been looking over the shoulder longer, um, you know, since it has been almost five decades since the ACLU first called for federal, federal oversight. This is not new. No, absolutely not. You know, what's new is the consent decree, but the need- Explain to what the term consent decree is, a legal term. What does it mean? It's essentially an agreement between the city and the Department of Justice that they will meet certain benchmarks. Um, again, these benchmarks are, if this were a standardized test, it would mean proficient. So there's always room to become advanced proficient. You, you know, better make these changes to what it says. Absolutely. Making changes, making the right changes, and acknowledging that you can still go above and beyond to make sure that you know people's rights are respected um, and that the culture of policing has changed. Some folks say it's so hard to talk about police minority relations. Then you have 600 people coming to the New Jersey Performing Arts Center to want to be a part of the discussion. Great panelists. What does that tell you? Well, you know, whether it's hard to talk about and wanting to talk about it are sometimes two different things. Um, and that oftentimes people want to engage in the conversation and don't know how. And frankly, a lot of it is, you know, political correctness and shying away from sometimes saying the things that people want to say or need to say, and also a question of audience and reception that, you know, sometimes leads conversations to be not the most productive. But we have to have this conversation. Oh, absolutely. There's, you know, no way to get change in the type of transformation that we're looking for without having the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. We are here at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. This is where some of the most important conversations take place, and tonight may be just about the most important conversation a conversation called uh, Moving New Jersey's Communities Forward, a critical conversation about race and policing. The Institute for Social Justice and other organizers um, putting it together. The irony is I got an email from this young lady. <laughs> but so many other people are a part of this. Micheline Davis, one of the top executives at RWJ Barnabas Health, but someone who cares about this issue on so many levels. This conversation is so important because... This conversation is so important because of where we are right now as a nation, right? This conversation is important so that we level set, that we take a, a moment and step back away from the emotionalism that many individuals feel across the country and even locally, and take a, a good, hard look at both ourselves and our neighbors to understand exactly where they sit and where they stand so that we can forge ahead together. We've often talked about how challenging it is to have an honest conversation where people can feel safe and comfortable putting it out there as opposed to not saying what they really feel and think, right? Yeah, absolutely. There is nothing more important than community dialogue. Having an opportunity to, even where we may very well not agree, to respectfully disagree. The most important thing, Steve, is having a safe space to exchange those ideas. And that is what the Institute for Social Justice has given us tonight. And let's talk about Ryan Haygood, who, we, Ryan, we did a, we said we we're going to talk for two minutes. We wound up doing a great 10 minute interview with him where he talked about the bigger picture, including some very specific recommendations, 10 concrete recommendations that won't fix things, but will improve things dramatically. How important is it, Micheline, to actually come up with 
recommendations to make things better between the police and minority community? Oh my goodness, it is incredibly important. You know, one of the interesting aspects is, is the fact that when we get the right individuals in the room, and by saying the right individuals, I mean the community as well. We have a true opportunity to, tr to really have true exchange about what they feel their community needs. Having the police at that table as well gives us the dialogue that gives us a, a great exchange about what the police community needs so that we are not combative one with another, but instead, again, Steve, that we're deciding that we each and every one of us deserve to have um, a great opportunity at living a long and fruitful life. So having community dialogue like this in a safe space, one that is also incredibly um, instructive, one that gives individuals a charge so that there's a takeaway and there's a strategy on how to employ it, it actually gives folks the toolkit in order to make the change that we seek. And finally, having here at NJPAC matters? It matters because here we are in the heart of this great city under great leadership at the right time. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Northward Center, PSE&G, the Fidelco Group, Verizon, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, Josh S. Weston, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. There are still half a million uninsured people in New Jersey who are eligible for free or low-cost health insurance. Do you or someone you know need health insurance? Or has your insurance recently changed? Healthcare.gov provides all the information you need to find new coverage. Open enrollment starts November 1st. You may qualify for financial assistance or for New Jersey Family Care. Free local assistance is available to help you understand your options and get enrolled before the deadline so you don't have to pay the penalty.